Prototype, that's right. Um, hi guys, uh, can you hear me all right at the back? Uh, so yeah, my name is Tadas Labudis, and I'm the founder of Prototype. And Prototype is is a tool that helps companies learn from their users, um, so they can make better decisions. So I'm going to tell you my story today. Uh, disclaimer: It's not a technical talk. We're not going to go into the types of languages or stack I used, uh, because I think at this stage it's it's probably not most interesting, and there's better people to to share the, uh, these kinds of nuggets with you. But I'm I'm going to share the the things I've done over the years, and you know the, the the things that went well, the things that went not so well, and how I got to the point that I am today. And hopefully, if you're you know are considering starting a company or just want to kind of know how, how it goes behind the scenes, that might give you some insight. So let's just crack on. Um, so I got into startups. Uh, my story actually starts at the uh, Central Hotel in Glasgow. I came to Scotland when I was 18 uh, to study. And basically to fund myself, I, I got a job as a banqueting porter. So I was rolling big tables and chairs and all kinds of things, preparing rooms um, at this hotel, uh, and then studying in the mornings. Um, and I hated this job. It was really bad. Uh, I wasn't exercising any kind of creative um, skills or knowledge, and wasn't learning much. Uh, I was just kind of doing this menial job. But, but I couldn't find a better job because, I first, I didn't have any marketable skills at that point, And also, I didn't speak English very well. So I started thinking of these business ideas, like thinking of things I could sell uh, or things I could do to kind of independently make money. Um, so the hotel was run so poorly that it basically went bankrupt six months in. And I got a kick in the butt that I needed to, uh, uh, to start my business. So there was nothing else I could do but just try and sell something. So I was a drummer, and I, I knew how to make websites. And I built this basic site, uh, an e-commerce store, and I basically put my own drums as stock on this website and, and just, just hoped that someone would buy something. Uh, so within days, I sold my first item, and I sold some more. And you know, I used the money to buy more stock. And then in a few months, I was generating enough money to pay my rent and my food, food costs. Um, so that was pretty good. I was, I was running that throughout my studies. Um, then I got into the University of Glasgow. I wasn't studying computing science, it was a business. Um, but there I started thinking of other types of ideas I could do. Um, I was thinking, with, a, with an e-commerce business, I have to carry cash and you know, buy expensive equipment. And sometimes people wouldn't buy the drums I bought. And I thought, maybe there's a more scalable kind of online digital business I could start. So, we kind of looked around the problems we understood, and that was uh, student societies. They had events, but people, the freshers especially, couldn't find them. So we thought, let's create a social network for a university, and let's put all the societies and events on that, and we're gonna, we're, it's going to be great. So I partnered up with some friends, and we started this company, and we even had a launch party. Uh, so we, we, we did this big event with maybe 200 students, and 10 volunteers, uh, all wearing study man t-shirts. Uh, and we launched this thing. We got most of the societies at the University of Glasgow. Uh, but we struggled to get any, any, any traction. Facebook groups were just about kicking off. Uh, and obviously, all the students were on Facebook. So they found events there and, and abandoned study man. Um, by the way, I had way too much hair in that, in that photo. I'm the blonde one there. Uh, way too much hair. Um, so then we pivoted to a different idea. We thought, if we have this chicken and egg thing, uh, not being able to get uh, student society events, maybe let's, let's get any kind of events we can get. 
So we integrated with ticketing providers like Ticketmaster and Skittle, and basically we created this aggregating sky scanner for events, if you like. Um, and, and, and that was good. We even won some awards with this business, and I think the idea was great. Um, but our business model was to sell tickets, and we had this affiliate commission thing, and we basically had to sell thousands of tickets every month to make any cash at all. Um, I think that was the point when we realized that we don't quite have the background or the funds to scale a consumer business like that. And, you know, we're kind of the final dissertation was approaching and I, we just thought, let's just stop this business. We, you know, we learned a lesson and let's just get jobs and learn from others. So I was lucky to get hired as a product manager at Kodakan um, and it was an amazing place to work. Uh, I could for the first time work with bigger teams and very interesting ideas and they had a great culture and I was basically given a choice of working on one of the client projects which was at the time I think Skyscan or FanDuel or a top secret internal startup project. Um, because I had more startup experience I thought I'm gonna give this a try if it doesn't work out I'm gonna get on the client project anyway. It didn't quite work out that way but I went for the startup project and we are basically looking into this very broad space. What, how can we help shift workers communicate better or more efficiently? So it's a very broad spec, and we were basically doing lots of experiments, putting little random ads and landing pages all over, doing a lot of customer interviews, basically trying to learn what business idea might be viable in this space. And, and it was great. Um, shortly afterwards, uh, the company was acquired by FanDuel, and I was given another choice. Basically, this time around, I was given a choice of a job at FanDuel or becoming a founding employee at this new company that was based on the top secret project I was working on. I didn't know anything about sports or betting, uh, so I, you know, we packed our bags and we left and founded this company with six other employees at Kodakan. And we were basically building this the company was called Yavi. We were building a mobile app for shift workers, which would help them communicate with their coworkers, <laughs> but also kind of have access to important work information, uh, structured data like schedules and so on. Um, we were building a unicorn business. Basically, we were all hoping it's going to be worth a billion dollars one day, and we all had stock, and we thought we were going to be rich with this one. Um, and, and we were learning lots as well. It was a really good environment. Uh, we were obsessed with agile and lean. We had, we were doing a lot of customer research and forming our, our sprints and decisions by that. And we were, you know, shipping increments, incremental features every two weeks and measuring our progress with analytics. Uh, we had the right process, and we even had customers from many high street retail chains like, like EE and Vodafone and so on. But for me personally. You know, I was looking through this window and I was thinking about startup ideas I could run again. I was growing confident in my, my skills and knowledge. I felt like I, 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 I kind of had a better grasp of what a startup is about and how you can do one right. Uh, and I just really wanted to have this freedom to work on my own idea, uh, create, create my own job, work on my own terms, and create something from scratch that other people would use and enjoy. Um, so I started thinking about things I understood at that point. As a product manager, you kind of, I had to decide what features to build uh, to make customers happy. Development cost is high, so you kind of want to make the right decisions. Um, and I basically tried to use data to back my decisions. I was analyzing lots of data like surveys, support tickets we were getting, reviews, analytics, and so on. Uh, but it was kind of tricky, you know, to pull all that data together and then say, hey team, I've done this research and now we should do this. Um, it, it, was, it was a lot of kind of manual work and a lot of synthesis that just wasn't quite working for me. Uh, so I thought maybe there is a product in there. Maybe I could create something that would solve this problem for other people. So before I left my job at, at Yavi, I, I basically tried to create... Um, like a security plan. So I saved up six months of savings for, for myself in case things go wrong. Um, and I was basically in the mornings doing interview calls with customers, asking them about, about this problem. You know, how are they analyzing feedback? 
are there any issues, any issues I could solve for them? Um, and then I discovered that companies, kind of medium-sized companies are getting about 20,000 support tickets a month and it's really hard to crunch those. So I kind of isolated this one data source and I thought, okay, let's, let's see if I can help companies analyze this. Um, so it's kind of getting, getting to a more narrow scope for my project and and then I spoke to this guy, he's a get head of customer success at Homebase, and he said, extracting themes from customer support tickets is my Q1 priority. And I was like, you know, that's just such, such a succinct way of saying it, and it just really felt like, uh, like if, if I just solved that problem, I could get like 40 grand or whatever they were willing to pay for the solution. Um, so then I set out some assumptions. I thought, I'm gonna create something that will help me understand with data, if people want to analyze qualitative data from support tickets, will they give me access to their customer data so it can help? And will they pay for anything for the solution? And I'm a kind of like a self-taught developer. I'm not very, I wouldn't apply to a software job. I, I wouldn't get a good job. Um, but I, I know a bit of PHP and I built sites before. So I thought, you know, what's the smallest product I can build uh, and, and, and could validate all those assumptions with? Um, and then I came across this um, system called Intercom. And Intercom, if you wanted to analyze data, you basically had to build an API integration and put, pull it down and put in some kind of Excel or maybe Tableau or something like that and then analyze it. I thought most of the people who care about analyzing this data are probably non-technical. So let's see if I could help them at least half the way in this process. So I built a very simple utility which basically connected to people's intercom account and pulled down a CSV file with all the conversation transcripts neatly laid out. I, I built this in about, I don't know, say three or four weeks uh, and I launched it and I put some ads on, on Google. And within a week, I got my first customer. Uh, it was $5, which is not a lot of money, but there's a real company with real data set using my tool, uh, paying me something to solve this problem. They're, they're actually still going. It's, it's been eight months. They're still going with the tool. Now I upgraded them to $20 a month, um, but it's great. Actually, actually, I charged some people $500 to add an additional column on their, on their thing, which, which is not about, it's not about the money at this point, but it's about someone giving up something that gives me kind of sense whether there's value to be captured if I had the proper solution. So another outcome of this was figuring out what are the use cases? Uh, what are people doing with this data that could kind of help them more, capture more of the process and simplify it even more for them? And the main use case was the, the, the thing that the guy uh, from Homebase said, he, you know, they want to identify the top user issues and requests in support conversations and basically inform their decisions uh, based on that information. So I started building another system, which is now the main prod site offering. Um, and what it does, it connects your intercom account, it um, analyzes, analyzes your data automatically or uses your own tagging. Um, I say that in, in quotes because I'm the one who's analyzing, I'm the machine learning algorithm in here. But you know, it could be automated in the future, uh, and I'm looking into some ways to do that. But basically what it does, it, for them it takes thousands of their conversations and summarizes into a simple list of, you know, these are the top five issues that you should look at. Um, we already have some customer success, and you know, if there's a company that's actually logging into our tool every month to identify the top three issues, and they've actually now uh, you know, change some things about their site and they saw a reduction in support costs. That's it's all great feedback for us. Uh, but we also saw our cash flow grow. You know, it's, it's not large amounts of money, but it's, it's kind of gradual organic growth um, that we're getting through making incremental improvements to our product, um, which, is, which is encouraging. Um, so I kind of distilled a few lessons that I think are, that were important either decisions I made or things I did wrong and then learned from. Um, so talking to customers, I was already sold on this. Um, this is something I learned as part of Kotick and the Yavi experience. So I used this 
um, to inform all decisions every, every step of the way. Uh, if I haven't spoken to customers, I wouldn't have known that on intercom you cannot export the data and then that's a big problem for non-technical users. If I haven't spoken to users, I wouldn't have known that they do want to pay for a solution like this at all or it's even a problem. So uh, talking to customers, if you have any idea, you don't need to have a solution in mind to, to learn about someone's problems and understand if there is something uh, you could create as a product or solution. Another thing that I found important is there are some startups that some technical founders um, might have an inclination to focus on perfecting the solution. You know, if it's, if it's not ready, it doesn't have all those features, it feels like you cannot launch it because if you did, you will just fail. Um, and I think in some cases for some products, that's absolutely right. For some of the kind of digital tools, there's always a way you can slice out uh, a solution that's smaller um, that you could put out there and it's, it completely solves the problem and then kind of incrementally grow. And then once you found that that solution is actually being adopted, you can optimize it. You can always refactor your code, add additional features or functionality. So to give an analogy, I think the kind of the, the perf perfectionist approach would be to build the perfect wheel and in this case, we're trying to solve someone's traveling problem. They want to get from point A to point B, and we want to give them a solution. The perf perfectionist approach would be to create the perfect wheel, the perfect drivetrain, the perfect body or chassis, and then you deliver the car and the customer is happy. The problem with this approach is the customer is not going to be happy until you completely solve this problem with the full product. But if you look at the kind of incremental steps you could go. Um, you could create a skateboard. You know, it's not great, you don't have any shelter, but with a skateboard you can get from a point A to point B. Um, based on customer feedback, you might realize that people want uh, you know, a more stable way to get from A to B, you know, and, and then you create a scooter, uh, and then you create a bike, and then you create a motorcycle. At each step of the way, the solution solves the problem just in a kind of more simple way. Um, so that's the approach I've, I've tried to use here. I created the intercom export. It solved a very smart part of the problem. Then I created ProdSight. It now does some of the crunching of the data that the, the people used to do in Excel. And then there's millions of ideas that I've gathered that could improve it even further. Um, another aspect that's been important is kind of managing the burn rate. So basically, uh, when you're a founder, you don't have any funding, you're spending your savings. Um, and the, the more money you spend on your personal costs or business costs, the less time you have to try this idea. Uh, burn rate is basically the revenue you get. In most cases, it starts at zero. So it's just the cost, um, and that's the amount of money you burn every month. So. Knowing how to code is a big advantage. Um, you know, coders are expensive. Companies pay a lot of money to hire them. Consultants get even more money. Um, so imagine if you have a startup idea and you're not a coder, you need to find someone and pay them, I don't know, 400 pounds a day to do the, the bit of work. If it's your friend, maybe you could get away with 200 or 100, uh, but still a lot of money at this stage. So if you know how to code, you're basically cutting that cost out completely reducing your burn rate. Um, now keeping personal costs low is another thing. Um, that's basically what I had to do before I even started, kind of figuring out what can I cut out of my normal spending. And I was in a job for, for the three years uh, that, uh, before I started this company and I kind of got comfortable with certain luxuries like going out, you know, traveling, uh, buying gadgets and stuff like that. Uh, so I thought like, okay, what's what are the basics and what are the things I could live without so I can do the startup journey? And uh, to illustrate, let's say you have 6,000 pounds, which is about how much I saved up. Um, and you're spending two grand on living costs each month. Uh, you basically would have three months before the money runs out. In three months, I guess, if you're lucky, you could strike some kind of uh, genius idea and maybe get traction and then I don't know, use that to raise investment, 
or, or convince your friends and family to help you uh, and then extend your runway. But basically, that's three months. You, if you succeed, that's great. If, if not, then you don't have any more time. But if you cut your costs down to 1,000 pounds, you double your time. You, you have more ideas to try. Um, another thing is monetizing. So very much in line with this incremental product improvement, can you incrementally deliver value and charge some amount of money? So with Intercom Export, I was able to charge $5 and then $12 and then $20 and so on uh, by gradually improving the product. You know, I think if, if there's a way you can think of solving someone's problem and getting money from day one, you should do it. Um, because the, the other alternative is there's some startups who raise a bunch of money, they hire the big team, and you try and build this big product. And then you kind of put all your baskets in that one product. If the product doesn't perform as well as you forecasted, um, you know, you don't make as much money, your, your burn rate's still, still high, investors lose interest and employees leave. Um, and then you had one, one, one shot that, that you had. Um, so let's just look how earning a bit of money could improve your runway. Uh, now, let's say we had those six months. Uh, and now, let's say we we're making 500 pounds each month uh, of revenue by selling our product or service, which is very similar to what I've done. Uh, now you have 12 months worth of time. Now we can try even more ideas. Um, so it's, it's worth charging from day one if you can. The ultimate goal is to become ramen profitable. And ramen profitable is, I think, Paul Graham from Y Combinator, he said that. I'm not sure, don't quote me on that. Uh, the idea is to essentially master, match your costs with income. Uh, so you're kind of infinite, you have infinite runway because you're not burning any cash. You're just kind of flatlining. Um, and, and that you can do with cutting your costs down and increasing your potential revenue as much as you can. What I've done, I've done a little bit of PHP consulting, which was like four or five days a, a month to kind of get that revenue in and keep my, keep my line up. Um, and <laughs> the, the biggest benefit of that is that you are in a very strong position. Like if you're in an investor negotiation uh, and you want to raise some money, they know that your time's running out, so they have all the, all the power in that, in that situation. If you have infinite runway, you could get investment on your terms. And if, if the deal doesn't seem like it's, it, it's meeting your needs, you could walk away from that and you know, keep finding other ways to grow. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's good if you can do that. Um, and I think lastly, staying sane is, is the biggest challenge for me. I'm a sole founder, I don't have a co-founder, so I'm just kind of like doing this alone and, and, uh, and just kind of sometimes feels like you're just lost in a jungle and trying to find a way back. Like in retrospect, looking at all these like milestones I achieved with this process, although they're small, it kind of seems like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Obviously you would do that idea and then you'd get these customers. But when you're in the moment, it's, it doesn't feel like, it feels like you could walk away, no one would care. You don't have customers, you don't have investors, you don't have employees. No one would even know you tried. Um, so how do you stay motivated and how do you stay healthy and productive? Um, there's a few tricks that help me. Uh, getting a co-working space helped. Just having a space where you can have a nice monitor, nice ergonomic uh, workspace for yourself. So you can go there, separate your personal life from work life. Um, and, and, you know, for the, for the eight hours or nine hours or how many, uh, you can work on, on your business. I think that's been life-changing for me. Um, also, there's like having people around. You don't, you don't feel as alone. You could have a chat. You could, you could imagine that you're working as part of this 12 or 20 person company that's, that, that are working uh, in that space. Another thing is like having hobbies and social life. So sometimes despite having the workspace and leaving the work stuff behind, I would still feel like uh, I would think about the work ideas and the things that are not going well. So I started finding ways to switch off from that. And I think the best way is not to go into a park and you know, dream, but actually do something else. And I started making electronic music not very good at it, um, but I noticed the powerful effect of switching context completely. Um, 
So I think, you know, there might be a temptation to sp spend all working hours working on this idea, but switching off and kind of coming back refreshed uh, actually is the more predictive way, although it feels counterintuitive. And lastly, accountability. Like, because you're just by yourself, you don't have a boss uh, breathing on your neck, and you just kind of, you, you know, you, you could you could you could take a month if you want to work on a certain milestone, or you, or you could take a year, um, as long as you have that the money and the burn is is manageable. Uh, you could actually procrastinate quite a lot, just like with a dissertation or a PhD. Um, so putting processes in place where you're like checking in. Have I made this progress? Have I delivered on this promise I made to myself last week? And having a mentor, actually finding a mentor to check in every two weeks has been um, transformational for me. Otherwise, I think I wouldn't have kept as accountable as I was. Um, but if it fails, you can always get a job. I think it's it's great experience, you know, like trying things and failing, and then getting a job is fine as long as you have skills that you pick up along the way. Uh, so there's always a way out. It's not. It's not the end of the world if it doesn't work out. So what's next for us? Um, you know, closing the seed round. Although I, I talked about managing burn rate and being environment profitable, that's just one stage. If you want to grow the company and stay competitive, you need to go even faster, and that's where the money comes in. Uh, and I also need a lot of technical help. My system doesn't scale. Uh, some of the bigger clients I can support, my careers take ages to load. So I'm hiring a developer to help me out with that. And then once we close around, trying to scale the product and sales and go from there. Uh, but if you have any startup ideas or you just want to hear more about anything I've done or just have a chat, you know, I'm always open uh, for meeting for coffee or just having a chat. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I did. Um, the way I did it is basically I would, with Intercom Export, there was an interesting stage where I would get, I would convert a free customer to a paying customer every 10 signups. And I was like, if that's rate, you know, that's a pretty good conversion. And I thought, if I increase the price, they would probably still convert. And that's how I went from $5 to $12 and then to $20, and now I'm charging $9 to $9 on the biggest plan. Uh, and it sounds ridiculous for such a small tool, but that's that's the pricing experiment. Um, I think that was a positive thing. By the way, the whole thing was very good, I thought. Um, but have you tested only having one plan on your landing page? Um, that, that's how I started. I had this $5 all-inclusive. Uh, then what I've done, I broke it down by kind of like the size of the account. So the more conversations, the, the price here. Uh, and that, that's, that's allowed us to generate more revenue. Another thing we've done, introduced annual plans. And actually, we sold four of those, I think. And that's brought, that brought to the cash flow. Um, One suggestion yep. to try, because it might not work, is um, do you have like a $99 plan or something? Mm -hmm. Only offer that on the landing page. And if people contact you, you can offer different stuff. That's so a good idea. I like the charging. Yeah. And there's been a guy who said, actually, I would have paid much more for this, but don't charge me more. <laughs> <laughs> and also, people trust it more if it costs more. Yeah. I, employees, I, because it must, be, it, must, yeah. Yeah, it must be more real or whatever in their mind. Yeah, yeah. You're spot on. Uh, I, th I think you're right. I, I was undercharging. Maybe you still are. <laughs> so I have a question for you. With the product, so you just like to see the software as a service? Uh, yes. Uh, and then uh, my question is, uh, do you see it as a standalone product, or is it more like you could do market as a plug-in to something else, kind of piggybacking on the other system? So, so, uh -huh. uh, so are you basically for like an amazing value-creating plug-in to something else, or mm -hmm. do you market it as a standalone tool, or do you want to plug into different things? I'm just curious. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely, right now it's a plugin. So I think there's it's it's a kind of well-known tactic, piggybacking on a platform or a wave. So if you've seen a lot of apps like uh, piggybacking on, on Facebook app platform and, and you know like Farmwell or things like that, which couldn't exist without the platform, but then obviously you could say, oh, Facebook create a game that like they didn't create that game. 
Uh, Slack was another thing, a big wave. So I think what we are doing with Intercom, like they're growing, they just raised, I think, something like $300 million to invest in their platform. So I expect the company to grow, but absolutely, in the long term, absolutely want to have integrations with all the top customer support systems, surveying systems, any source of feedback that we could plug in. And I think that, that would be the stage where we're less dependent on the platform or a single platform and more on a standalone product. Sure. So, as somebody who's not comfortable with any experience in this sort of an area, the thing that strikes me as the biggest challenge is actually getting the customers in, mm -hmm. um, getting them to know about you, getting them to like know that this is a challenge that they have, and then yeah. they do then sell the product to them. How, how do you go about actually advertising it to them and to get the customers in in the first place? Yeah, so I think... Um, at, at the very early days, you kind of want to initiate contact yourself uh, because obviously they don't know you, they don't know you exist or have the solution. Uh, so the first step was to try and find people who might have this problem. So it's more of a hunch. And then having research-based conversations, say, saying like, hey, you know, I saw your intercom and I just really wonder how, how you're analyzing your feedback. Can we have a 15-minute chat? I'll, I'll buy you a coffee or whatever. And that's how we got the first few customers um, that didn't actually end up being the main source of the customers. But that's how we validated that there's a, this problem to solve and then validated the solution worked. But after that, I knew the language they were using to describe their problem, which was like, I want to export data from Intercom. I bought a domain name called intercomexport.com and I put that out there and I used these keywords to advertise. And people are typing in those things and reaching me. Uh, and if the product meets their needs, they sign, sign up, right? So I'm actually not doing any direct sales an, anymore for the intercom export. What I'm doing, I'm saying, oh, you want to export your data? What's your use case? Prodside might be a better tool for that or save you more time or whatever. So I think I haven't yet figured out how to sell Prodside on its own without the intercom export. Um, but that's going to be the next challenge. Yep. Can you say something more about the mentoring aspect? You, I didn't quite understand the, the slide that you put up there. Mm -hmm. so, you know, how you found somebody and, and just say a bit more about it. Yeah, sorry. Actually, I should have explained that slide as, as the way I track my metrics and keep myself accountable uh, through that software. But uh, uh, it's the, the mentor. Actually, he's in the room. It's Martin, Martin Lin. Can you raise your hand? Yeah, he's an awesome dude. Uh, he's, a, he's a startup founder who's kind of a few years ahead of me in terms of his progress. So he's kind of been through the things I'm going to go through. Uh, and what we arranged, I said, Martin, can you listen to my problems and my progress every two weeks over coffee? Uh, so that I kind of, I have this moment in, in my time to prepare the notes and think about my progress. Uh, and actually have someone who's like, hey, you said you're going to achieve this, but you didn't. Uh, actually, he's been more valuable in other ways, but um, just having that check-in point where, where it feels like the world cares about what you're doing, I think it's very crucial at, at these early stages. Maybe later on you have more momentum in other ways. What was on the slides? On the slides, there was a tool called 15.5, which is a c continuous self-improvement tool. Uh, essentially designed to track goals and then make sure everyone in the company is aligned and you can record progress on a regular basis. The idea is it's called 15.5 because managers are meant to, so our employees 50, spend 15 minutes every week to log their progress and managers spend five minutes reviewing that. Uh, but at the moment I'm just using it by myself so, so, so it's kind of more of a, a log of what I'm doing. <laughs> Actually, a mixture. I really found useful the Slack communities. So there are some uh, like product school, and there would be a bunch of different product managers there. Uh, so if I think product managers would be the right target, I would go on there and say, hey, guys, I'm doing research in this area. Could anyone speak to me for 10 minutes? Or like tracking the messages they've posted. And if it's relevant, I would say, you know, you said this thing. 
about this problem. I'm actually looking at a solution. Can we have a chat? And people are very open because they're so relevant. Um, not everyone will speak to you, especially if it's kind of more far reaching. Uh, LinkedIn worked as well. Uh, reaching out to contacts, you know, you, you see someone who's connected to you through a second degree, uh, and then you say, oh, I'm working on this, can you introduce me? And people are really helpful. I actually found people more helpful than I expected uh, in this startup journey so far. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much. talk to us about exploiting the cloud and well moving to the cloud so take it away hi everyone um, i'm alex sage i'm going to talk about uh, particularly migrating to the cloud but also running your applications there and evolving them with time because obviously migrating is just the first step uh, so what we'll cover uh, i'm going to assume you know why to move to cloud so in the interest of time we're going to kind of skip that if you don't ask in the pub afterwards uh, main focus will be on the migration strategies and technical challenges for that and uh, there'll be dragons in these areas. So we'll focus a lot on what can go wrong, what are your different choices in that. Uh, and it's important to note, like you only get good at this by doing it lots of times. So reading a book or uh, this presentation is gonna give you some insights into uh, some good things, but as Andy Jassy said, there's no compression algorithm for experience. So obligatory company slide, uh, I'm VP engineering at CloudSoft. Uh, we help companies uh, migrate, run, evolve their applications in the cloud for all the usual cloud reasons. Uh, we're experts in uh, cloud with various uh, AWS certified uh, associates and pros in different areas. Uh, a lot of automation expertise, spending a lot of time in uh, DevOps, and we also have app developer backgrounds, which means we can help out in the full stack. So on to uh, the important stuff. So what are the, uh, the challenges according to uh, the right scale state of cloud report from this year. Uh, so if we look at the different columns, then beginners, very concerned about security. C can they actually do this right? Uh, how do they find people who are gonna help them do this and so on? But all of these same things appear in each of the columns just with different priorities. Uh, so it's interesting to see how these ca those kind of vary. So uh, you'll notice that the lack of expertise uh, trends downwards. And that's kind of indication that when you're good at cloud, it's easy to attract talent because people want to come and work for you and do the cool stuff and do it well. Uh, when you're new and you really need the talent, it's very hard to get it. It's very hard to uh, find, attract, afford, and retain that. Uh, also, I'll call out costs. So that's a reflection of how well you're doing cloud. So if you're doing cloud badly, like you are treating it like the old school data centers where you're handling peak load with a whole bunch of virtual machines, you don't have automation, if you're not doing Agile properly, then costs are going to be very high. Uh, are you turning off your dev and test resources when you don't need them? All this kind of thing. Uh, so costs, you can think of as a trailing indicator for how good you are at cloud. Right, so onto the, the main bulk of this are in cloud migration. So there's different strategies for this. Uh, these terminology that came from uh, Amazon, so the AWS uh, description of how do you migrate to the cloud. Uh, things get increasingly technical as we go up. So it starts off at the, the bottom of, let's just turn the thing off, retire it. Uh, so is there a, a business goal that's justified by having this application? Uh, do you want to retain it, so leave it where it is? Do you want to repurchase it, so replace it with software as a service? Or the things which people generally think about migration of re-host, re-platform, refactor. So uh, for each of your applications, or you're going to First of all, you're going to determine what are your business objectives, uh, what is the business case for doing this. Uh, you're going to somehow find out what apps you have out there. You'd think that people would already know that, but a lot of people uh, have to do a scan. Their CMDBs aren't up to date, and so on. We'll come back to that later. Uh, and for each of those applications, you then can decide what is the right strategy for that, uh, do the migration, and iterative improvements. Uh, it's worrying how many companies launch into the migration uh, program not having done it before and try to migrate lots of things. So I'd really recommend you start with one app, you migrate that, you learn from that experience, figure out how to improve that, and then uh, you migrate others. Maybe start with a simple app and start with a complex app and uh, see how those go. A lot of learnings and then you'll do the other ones better. So uh, we can think of uh, those sort of six categories on a spectrum of agility. Uh, so if you, uh, retain your app, 
you haven't really gained anything from doing this, but that's fine. You haven't invested any effort either. Uh, if you re-host it, so you lift and shift, it's running in the same way, but now in the cloud. So uh, you haven't gained that much. If you retire it, you've turned some stuff off, less stuff to maintain, that's a bonus. Uh, and then you've got, so re-platform, uh, that's taking advantage of various cloud features. So you've, uh, that's gonna give you some level of uh, improved agility. Repurchase, really, again, we're not managing as much stuff. And uh, refactor, which is the hardest one to rewrite stuff as cloud native. Uh, or what I think is a better way, the agile way, instead of just going for a full refactor, we don't get any benefits until you've finished, then can you actually go for this iterative refactoring approach where you incrementally adjust your application? And one last sort of summary slide of those, then you can also think of this as how long will it take you? So if you're gonna repurchase, hopefully pretty quick, rehost, so that's the lift and shift, migrations are the fastest way, I'm gonna replatform, so I'm gonna take advantage of some cloud features, or I'm gonna refactor. Uh, so onto the, the first of those. Um, and I think it's important that people remember all six of these rather than just focusing on cloud migration, because uh, particularly large organizations, it's not uncommon to have 20 to 30% of stuff that's running in your existing virtualization environment is not needed, and you can actually turn it off. So people have test systems, QA systems, pilot projects that have been left running, or backup systems that aren't needed anymore. Uh, people um, look in their CMDB thinking that's actually gonna be accurate, uh, whereas actually uh, it's very out of date. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of free tooling out there that you can use to uh, scan and your environment and find out what's running and then decide what to do. Uh, so if you're partnering with somebody who's gonna help you with the cloud migration for a large organization in particular, then a lot of people who will come in, they'll be biased depending on what tools they have available. So if they've got tools that help you to do lift and shift, they're not gonna help you to turn stuff off. They're going to go, we've scanned your VMware environment and it's all moving into, for example, AWS. And you've lost that ability to get rid of 20 to 30% of uh, the stuff that you don't need. And you're probably not gonna have that opportunity again because you're, uh, you're not gonna analyze things as they move. Uh, so for retain, uh, there's some very good reasons for not moving to the cloud, obviously. So have you got some sunk costs? You've just bought a whole load of shiny new kit in your data center, so it's not cost justifiable to uh, move to the cloud. Uh, are there legacy hardware or software requirements that it's difficult to replicate in the cloud, in which case leave that thing there? Or maybe there's just insufficient business justification to, to bother with this. Or maybe there's compliance reasons, so the contract says that you must host this data in, in your own data center or for other uh, regulatory compliance reasons. Uh, so we've probably all either uh, seen or heard of uh, things like there's a server sitting in the corner with a sticky note saying, do not turn off. It's like, how do you move that into the cloud? So, um, or another friend was working on a migration project that's now been going for 10 years. Uh, and the suspicion is the managers in charge of this are just really hopeful they get to retire before anyone actually pushes the button to migrate that app. Uh, so there's certain things where, you know, like retain is the right strategy. Uh, repurchase, if you can do that, is a, a brilliant one. So here's where you, you can switch to a consumption model for software as a service. So good examples would be uh, email servers or ticketing systems. So do you really want to run your own uh, version of that when you could just be using uh, like Gmail for enterprise or, or something like that? Uh, and the opportunity to retire these uh, legacy enterprise software, reduce the requirements of your in-house skills is very appealing. Uh, there are some risks involved in that. So uh, how is this particular software being used? Do you really understand all that wiring and how to reconfigure that? Uh, what about the the procurement team from finance, so if you're now having a consumption-based model, can they really handle that? Uh, so there's a whole lot of business reasons why this stuff gets hard. And also, from the operations side of things, uh, it's very much a people and processes side where people need to have a mind shift as to how they're gonna do this. Um, companies often just migrate stuff, not wanting to go for the repurchasing. Uh, far too often we hear things about like, they're special or the requirements are different. Uh, but a key question then is like, is that difference really your USP? Is that your unique selling point? And if it's not, is that actually a code, sell or a code smell or a process smell that you think you're so different from everyone else that that software as a service is not really gonna do what you want? Uh, another one we've come across when we help customers is like, beware contractors who previously worked there 
and they've made stuff customized and complex configuration to keep themselves in a job. Uh, so yeah, the, the stuff out there is, is quite scary. Um, and then other people who help with cloud migrations, often they have like the one tool is a hammer, so everything's a nail, they're gonna lift and shift everything into the cloud for you, for example. Which brings me on to lift and shift. Uh, so how does that work? Um, we're shifting all the VM images. So for example, it might scan your VMware environment. Uh, it'll take uh, images of those VMs. It'll shift all those bits across into VMs in, in your cloud, shift all the data. There's a whole bunch of migration tools out there. So I've listed some of the AWS ones that we have, uh, but there's various other companies who have a bunch of tooling to do this. It is the most common approach for uh, migrating applications. Reason being that uh, it's fast and it's simple to understand. And sometimes that is absolutely the right thing to do. So uh, is there a compelling reason why you need to move by a particular date? Is your data center about to close? Uh, so you don't have a choice, you need to move quickly, go for that. Or just you're happy to do this migration and then you're going to iteratively evolve that afterwards. Uh, but a lot of people who do that migration, they don't budget for that iterative involvement. So there's a lot of tidy up and fixing costs that they haven't budgeted for because they think that cloud migration just involves moving it to the cloud. Uh, however, often that lift and shift mentality leads to um, an inflexible process that can have a brittle outcome. So you've moved not just all your VMs, but also your, uh, your processes and ways of working to not be able to actually get the benefits of cloud. Uh, so are you gonna make use of these higher order services, these more advanced security, uh, resilience, agility, and so on? Uh, so, or are your costs not actually gonna reduce through through cloud usage. Uh, so the next one is the replatforming. So how does that work? Uh, it's similar to lift and shift, except you're being more uh, tactical about uh, which areas do I want to uh, switch out components. So keep the same architecture as it's currently got, uh, but switch out for cloud optimized things. So for example, uh, if you need a load balancer, instead of moving your Nginx server, could you just switch to uh, the cloud's load balancer? If you um, need to run your database, are you really gonna run that in your VM? Are your database administrators in your company really as good as Amazon's database administrators? Unless you're a large organization, the answer is almost certainly no. So switch to RDS, or if you're switching to Azure, trust Microsoft to run MS SQL for you because they're gonna do it better than you unless you are a tier one bank. Um, this also gives uh, optionally time to uh, invest in understanding the architecture, understanding the wiring of those components. Uh, so to that point, uh, we've worked with a, a customer where they give us a list of what was on the servers, they explained their architecture, and they forgot a couple of the components that were running on this. Uh, if we'd done a lift and shift, it would have worked fine, and they'd have just continue to not remember about those, not have them documented. Uh, instead, we were going for uh, an automated way of reproducing their VMs, so we wrote the scripts, the configuration as code, set up those servers, and it didn't work because these two components were missing. And it wasn't until we kind of handed over their kind of staging environment for them to test, they discovered that, uh, and that revealed some glaring problems in their disaster recovery process where they didn't know to add these components back in, and also they weren't backing up one of them. Uh, so the benefits of that replatforming, so it's, as long as you know what you're doing, it's not too difficult you get some of the benefits of uh, a cloud native application. So you can reduce costs by reducing the number of VMs you need and running with uh, highly scalable load balancers and so on. Uh, but if you don't know what you're doing, that is a risk. You need to know uh, how to use the cloud well, but that's a recurring theme throughout this. Uh, you mustn't be overly aggressive with how much change you're gonna make. So do that iteratively uh, and only choose common well-known shapes that you're going to actually switch out. Uh, another risk is not using automation. So if you find people going around, clicking around in the console, setting things up, then that is definitely a risk because how reproducible is that? Do you really know what's happened there? I'll come back to that later. And onto the last one. So refactor, um, also known as cloud native. So to pause for a second and say, what does cloud native mean? So it really means, I think, two different things to different groups of people. Originally it meant using cloud well. So how do you write your apps to handle failures, uh, to be able to auto scale well, uh, and to use cloud services well. Uh, but these days, uh, if you search for cloud native, you probably reach the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, 
uh, which is for projects that orchestrate containers as part of a microservices architecture. So cloud native has become to mean Docker and Kubernetes being done well. Uh, I'm going to use it in the kind of a mix of those things. Like if you are happy to uh, just use VMs very well and use cloud services very well, and you call that cloud native, absolutely fine with me. Uh, so what does it involve? Uh, it can involve transfer, transforming a lot or everything in your application, switching, um, taking a monolith and turning it into sort of, uh, microservices, uh, trying to swap out pieces of that architecture for uh, higher order cloud services, uh, trying to decouple all of this, uh, and potentially even changing the, the data stores to try to use the most appropriate data store for different, different parts of your components. Uh, the driver for this is where like, there's a genuine business that needs to invest all this effort. Uh, you need to have uh, features or scale or performance that that sort of cloud native approach can give you. Uh, it's the most expensive, time consuming way of doing it. Uh, but it does give you those long term costs. It gives you a very resilient, scalable, and uh, high performing uh, architecture and puts you in a good position to exploit um, future cloud innovations or Kubernetes innovations. Uh, but ob obvious risks that I've already alluded to of it's going to take you a long time to do this. Uh, there's a big chance of getting it wrong because you're changing so much at the same time and you need a very advanced skill set. Uh, so for example, Monzo Bank recently had an outage, which uh, they're really good at what they do. And it's just kind of an indication of how complex all of this stuff is. So um, they run Kubernetes. Uh, there was some complicated interaction between the Kubernetes etcd uh, and Linkerd versions that meant when they upgraded a set of things, it fell over. And uh, yeah, so this, you, the level of expertise you need to run Kubernetes well is extremely high. And also, uh, uh, I love this quote of, uh, I see you have a poorly uh, structured monolith, would you like me to convert it into a poorly structured set of microservices? <laughs> uh, so I, I've seen some great talks on microservices, but my favorite ones these days are definitely the ones um, such as Paddy Carey's talk, uh, from monolith to microservices and back again twice. So people who tell you about how it went wrong is extremely informative. So on to some of the technical challenges of the cloud. Uh, so first of all, there's a huge amount of best practices that are very well described out there uh, around how to do security well, how to do reliability. So are you going to spread it across availability zones, which is AWS's concept of different data centers? Uh, which cloud services should you use and when? Uh, but getting uh, the level of knowledge of that, even though there's great resources out there, there's so much to learn and so many nuances around um, how to use it, which services to use and when. Uh, next, um, cost control. So as I said at the start, uh, cost is a, a serious problem, particularly if you're not doing cloud well. So how do you predict the costs, particularly when there's variability because you're auto-scaling, uh, there's hidden costs like data transfer, which might not be taken into account initially, and then also the total cost of ownership. So are you managing stuff on those VMs yourself, or have you handed that over to, say, Amazon? So are you going to run your own Elasticsearch service, or are you going to let Amazon service for that do it? So the cost comparison between these different things is quite hard to do. Uh, but there's various things you can do to track costs over time as well. So you could tag things which allow you to break down your costs better, uh, right sizing your VMs over time, so don't just set out once and ignore it, uh, and also understanding reserved instances. So that's when you pay up front because you're going to commit to running a certain number of VMs for that time. So you pay for a VM for the year and you save 40% of your costs. Um, but there's a whole lot of business challenges as well with this. So I, uh, one of my colleagues was telling me about a, a customer he dealt with where uh, they offered the 50, 60 grand a month savings, so 20% off the monthly spend because they were paying on-demand prices for their static workloads. The number of VMs they had was very predictable, but they didn't have any of these reserved instances. They weren't paying up front. Uh, and the VP of finance was, was up for it, but the head of engineering, surprisingly, was saying no because they want to be in control of their process. They're going to decide what they're going to do, and maybe they're going to change their architecture. And three months later, they still didn't have the 60 grand a month saving. Um, so yeah. But that's because it's not coming out of his um, allowance, really. Uh, next technical challenge of networking. So 
you don't just want to move your VMs into the cloud, you want to make sure that you've got the right level of isolation, so which VMs need public IPs, which should, like as much as possible should be private, how do you lock down the security groups, that's called the firewalls in AWS, uh, to make sure that you have things as isolated as possible. But you'll still need to have to get into those um, those isolated networks sometimes, so you can be using VPNs, so you can have a bastion host, so that's like a jump host that you SSH into and use that to reach out to the other things. Uh, there's a lot of really powerful to tooling that allows you to set this stuff up if you know what you're doing. Uh, also then, um, user and account setup. Uh, so it's important that you have a separation between dev, prod, and backup. Uh, so there's been some uh, disturbing outages where um, companies have uh, had a sysadmin have two consoles open, accidentally clicked on the wrong one, and done a database truncate, which basically deletes the entire contents of the database. <laughs> uh, and then they didn't realize this had happened, so new users came in and created new accounts. Unfortunately, the IDs that these new users were given were duplicates of what was in the old database. So when they restored, these users had the same IDs and unfortunately saw somebody else's data. Um, so yeah, separation is very important. Also the privilege, the principle of least privilege. So don't give users uh, permissions that they don't need and make them assume rules so it's very explicit what they're going to do. Are you just working in dev environment, in which case you've assumed that dev rule and before you make a change in prod, you assume the prod rule and then uh, get out of that as soon as you finish working on it. And of course you track all the changes that are being done through the API calls, auto detect violations if somebody sets up some virtual machine that's open to the world you can also detect that quickly and, and know what to do. So in fact, Netflix will shut down that VM immediately if, you set, if, if they set things up uh, that don't follow their best practices. Uh, of course, there's automation tooling. So uh, I'm a big advocate of configuration as code uh, and automation in general. Uh, we've come across companies who say things like, uh, we're not big and complicated enough to do automation and configuration as code. We can just do things manually. And, the counter argument they give to that is like, uh, so as software developers, do you understand the benefits of code review, of version control, and of rollback? And if you do, why would you not do that in your infrastructure as well? Uh, also then, um, there's challenges around um, the, the skills and the mindset that people have. So this is not just traditional sysadmins, it's not infrastructure as a service, it's far more than that. And uh, if your people who are responsible for your VMware environment come in and look after your cloud, they're not gonna do it well. Uh, and a quote here, uh, so never underestimate the ability of politics and fiefdoms to interfere with cloud migration forecasts, says James Bond. Uh, who's the chief cloud technology <laughs> at HP. And I, I'm sure he probably gets that kind of <laughs> uh, misquote from him uh, all the time. Uh, but yeah, there's so many business challenges around this uh, and the cloud migration, you really need the uh, CXO level uh, commitment to making that uh, cloud migration success. Uh, and you need to understand uh, the, the business and the process implications. It's not just about t an IT project, it's a business transformation. Uh, which has a counterpoint, like if you're sitting in the room going, my job's gonna be taken away by uh, cloud, and if you want to scupper a project, <laughs> then the things to do would be to introduce those politics or make the cloud transformation as complex as possible by trying to adopt uh, as much refactoring as possible and make the project fail, or try to do everything at once. And the benefits of that cloud uh, project, it will take so long that it will lose um, the support from higher up. Uh, but assuming that you're on the good side, <laughs> Then, uh, in summary, like there's lots of benefits from this uh, cloud to reduce cost, increase uptime, even um, handling uh, um, events such as outages in a lot more graceful way, uh, but there's also a lot of complexity in that. Um, so consider uh, what's worth doing on your own versus engaging with cloud experts, uh, what resources are out there to, uh, to understand what those best practices are, to uh, avoid those risks, uh, reduce costs, and ensure that you've got the security you need. Any questions? Yep. Uh, question one is, do your clients typically use the total cost for clouds? Yes, it's going down, but that was, those are kind of the cost per VM is sort of frontline item that gets people in there, uh, but it's only a fraction of your total cost. I remember looking 
you know, AWS, you know, Dem- I never looked at the toilet, it was like staring up at this colossal <laughs> mountain, you had so much to learn where on earth do I start? Good question. It, it depends on uh, what you're thinking of when you say that in the, the role in the company. So if companies think you're doing it, like, so we treat companies who are at the early stage of we're thinking about cloud very differently. That's like a consulting gig where you don't expect to actually get anything like a sale for quite a long time because it takes a long time to make decisions uh, versus somebody who's already made a decision uh, and now they're looking for help to move to the cloud and maybe they're now looking up at AWS with this colossal mountain. Uh, and uh, it depends on the complexity of the application they're trying to do. Uh, so, but we've also seen people who they try to move to the cloud and they've done a reasonable job, but they haven't understood really about the, say, the isolated networks and how to set things up properly, how to set up uh, users correctly to, for that uh, principle of least privilege and, and so on. And therefore, we come in and sort of help them fix their account um, afterwards. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess this comes back to the start with a simple app. Uh, and if you're dealing with, say, a three tier web app, you know, to look at the, the load balancer section of the, the pages. Uh, are you going to look after the VMs or are you going to use something like a, um, a AWS light sale or, or Beanstalk that you can think of as like a, uh, they'll manage the VMs and you just say what uh, web app you want to run on those and then the database. So it really cuts down from the, say, 100 services that AWS offer down to just three of them that you need to worry about. One last thing I meant to say is that we are hiring, so if you're interested in working in this area, then come and talk to me afterwards as well.